Hi there, my name is Renee Hobbs. And I'm Kristen Hokinson. And here you are for Unit 3, Doctrine of Fair Use. We're so excited you're here. Here are the goals for this session. So during this session, we want you to really have a good, strong, solid understanding of the Doctrine of Fair Use and how it supports the First Amendment and ensures that copyright law does not become an instrument of censorship, especially in our classrooms. Very nice. We want you to gain an appreciation of the concept of transformativeness. It's really critical for being able to make a fair use determination. And once you understand that, you'll really learn how to make that fair use determination and gain confidence in recognizing the scopes and limits of fair use. So let's get started. Great. So obviously we remind you that the work that we're uh, sharing comes from uh, us at the Media Education Lab. Uh, at the University of Rhode Island at the Harrington School of Communication and Media. You can learn more about our work at www.mediaeducationlab.com forward slash copyright. And that this project really originated from a grant supported by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, a grant that resulted in the publication of the Code of Best Practices and Fair Use for Media Literacy Education. All right, so just a little reminder. At, at the end of our last session, we talked about how copyright law has strong protections for owners and strong protections for users. And our goal in this uh, session is really um, to strengthen our ability, um, not just to understand the law, but also to exercise our fair use in creating that balance between um, the users and the owners in this entire process. Yep. So, just a reminder, the Doctrine of Fair Use, Section 107 of the Copyright Law of 1976, is the balance that enables uh, copyright law to fulfill its obligation to promote innovation, creativity, and the spread of new ideas. So we're reminding you that the Doctrine of Fair Use's purpose is to encourage socially beneficial uses of copyright works. That's how it accomplishes the goal of uh, supporting the First Amendment. Now, one of the best cases that um, we can use to explain to you the doctrine of fair use comes from a really important case argued by the Second Supreme Court in 2006. The Second, Second Circuit Court is one level below the Supreme Court. So this ruling was a very influential case and it has a lot of relevance to uh, the work that teachers and students do in using copyrighted materials for digital learning. And what, what I think is, in this case, what I think is important about this case, and we're going to ask you to actually read this case and summarize it throughout this course, but what I think is most interesting is this is a commercial use um, of, of media in which um, we were publishing a great coffee table book. Uh, Darren Kinsley publishes great, lovely coffee table books. Was... Um, creating a book that uh, was reflective of the life and times um, during the Grateful Dead's kind of reign. They wanted to show how art and music and culture all kind of mirrored one another during that time. They were looking at it as a historical reference. Bill Graham Archives was the uh, company that bought the rights to those way cool, awesome, freaky posters that were used in Fillmore West in San Francisco during the 1960s to advertise bands like the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead. Now, when Dorling Kindersley, the publisher, came to ask permission to use those copyrighted posters in the book, Bill Graham Archives proposed a pretty large fee, a license fee that was quite large. Of course, there would be hundreds and hundreds of images in this coffee table book, and the publisher couldn't afford to pay such steep prices, so in the end, they couldn't come to an agreement. They couldn't negotiate a price for a license fee. That would be fair. And so the book publisher said, well, you know what? We really feel that we have a case to argue fair use um, of these posters, and, and that's what they did. They, they went ahead and put them in their book. Without asking permission or getting payment. And so immediately, Bill Graham Archives sued the publisher. And the case went all the way up to the Second Circuit Court, and the judge made a determination balancing the rights of the owner, that's Bill Graham Archives, against the right of the new user, that's the publishing firm. Now, I was fascinated when I first heard of this case. And this is an example of what we call transformative use. And we're going to be looking at this. We have an entire unit on transformative use. But the idea being that when we look at the purpose of the original posters, 
The posters were to generate publicity for a concert that had long since come and gone. Whereas in the new work, within this coffee table book, the purpose of those posters were document and illustrate the concert events in a historical context. It was a completely different um, intent and purpose than the original. And, and in that case, it becomes what we call transformative. And the judge recognized that in no way could the reproduction of the uh, poster be considered a substitute for the actual poster. It was very small. It was reproduced in the context of a whole page. So this idea that people can create new work by repurposing the creative work of others to create something new is a really important concept. Now, if you take a look, um, we're going to actually be asking you to watch um, a music video. It's called User's Rights Section 107, and it talks a little bit about um, it's a it's a great kind of um, schoolhouse rock way that teachers can illustrate this idea of users having rights within copyright and fair use as well. But what's interesting as you watch the video is it's going to bring up some important questions that you must ask whenever you're considering the use of copyrighted material in the question in the classroom. And so rather than using those charts and checklists, what we're really looking for educators to do and what educators need to do in the spirit of critical thinking is to really analyze whether or not your use of copyrighted material is a fair use. So in the law, the law specifies four factors that should be considered when making a fair use determination. The nature of the work, the purpose, the effect on the market, and the amount used. But within the last 15 years, judges have reinterpreted those four factors that in ways that help us in a little more clear way um, formulate questions that help us make a fair use determination. But you know, Renee, I think it's really important to remember because we're looking at four factors, if you go back to some of those uh, graphs and charts, something like defining 30 seconds of music as being fair is only considering one of those factors. So rather than just looking at the amount, if teachers were to ask themselves two questions, the first one is, when you used this copyrighted material, did your unlicensed use transform the original um, by using it for a different purpose, a different intent, or did it just simply repeat the work for the same intent and value as the original? So I see a lot of educators that maybe use a song that they really like um, and it's, it's entertaining and it entertains their students as background music um, to a slideshow. The original intent and purpose is to entertain, and the teacher's use of that song is to entertain as In well. In that case, it's not a transformative use. So the key idea here is that transformative use is when you repurpose the original copyrighted material for a new purpose. And the second question is... How much did you use? Was that material taken appropriate in kind and amount considering the original use of the original nature of the copyrighted work and then the use in the new context? So when we go back to that 30 second, I think back to a student uh, project that I did. Uh, we were doing um, public service announcements on drug addiction and the student found a very powerful song in which um, was really making uh, a statement um, about depression and some of the, the insights and used some very powerful imagery. And in order for them to really utilize that song, um, they needed to use 38 seconds, I think, or 39 seconds of the song, which was hovering right around that 30 mark. But it, we had built into our rubric in the guidelines said 30 seconds. In that instance, the student was actually um, practicing a fair use reasoning and had a better understanding of fair use than I did as the teacher who was simply trying to follow the rules. What's so interesting about this question, it's really, are you using just what you need? Now, are you using just what you need is going to depend differently on the different types of media. For instance, it's pretty hard to use just a tiny portion of an image. If you're going to do a transformative use of an image, it's very common you will have to use 100% of the whole image. So under some circumstances, courts have ruled that it is appropriate to use the whole thing. That's why the language of the, of the question is so interesting. Considering the nature of the copyrighted work and of your use, it's, it depends on the context and situation. And I think what's important is this idea of 
exercising your fair use reasoning involves critical thinking. It can't be something that is measured by a list or a checklist, right? We really need to take the time to think about what we are using, why we are using it, and articulate our purposes. And I think that that's one of the biggest trends in education these days as well, is having our students actually become critical thinkers and, and, and analyzers. So it practices and hits on a lot of skills as well. It's partly why media literacy educators are so fond of this idea of teaching about copyright and fair use because making a fair use determination demands that you involve reasoning and critical thinking. It's so. actually exercising those fair use muscles. So we're going to take some time now to actually do a couple of, of, of uh, examples. So the first one that I'm going to pull up um, talks a little bit about the importance of context and situation. And we used a Walt Disney film because uh, many of you know uh, Walt Disney um, tends to be very protective of the materials that they use. Um, and doesn't want it to be used or shared in any way, shape, or form. So if we give you um, a situation, I mean, in this particular one is one that's going to be very common, especially to elementary educators, where a team of elementary educators maybe shows the Disney movie uh, The Little Mermaid to three classes of grade three students on the day before winter break in the school auditorium. Oh, wow. Analyze the fair use uh, context. I'm going to ask myself, did this unlicensed use transform the material taken from the copyrighted work by using it for a different purpose than that of the original, or did it just repeat the work for the same intent and purpose? I don't know why the teachers are showing the Disney movie, but there is a little phrase there that catches me, uh, Kristen, when I'm making my fair use determination on the day before winter break in the school auditorium. This is something I wrote about back in 1996 in a piece called Non-Optimal Uses of, of Media in the Classroom. When media is used as a break, as a reward, as a prize, it's unlikely that it is educational use. Right, because of course it's for entertainment as well. And I think what's interesting about this piece um, is that we're showing the whole film, um, we're using it for the same intent and purpose, um, there doesn't, and and there are other situations where, in that case, we might want to license that work. We might want to buy a license in this I, situation. I want to throw a little wrench in your chain here, Renee, okay. because I did this a lot as an educator, um, but I was really passionate about having my kids do some critical analysis. And so I actually I, I chose grade three. This was the grade that I taught for a long time when I was in elementary school, uh, because we did a unit on um, on sea life. And we spent some time taking a look at the characteristics of nonfiction animals that were within the the video, um, with the the fish and the uh, and the crab, uh, the octopus, and how they were maybe portrayed in the movie. And the students did a little bit of research, and then. Because it was the day before winter break, we thought this would be a great time for the students to practice some of that fair use and reasoning. So we went and we watched the movie, and we took a look at our characters with some clipboards. Nice. And we analyzed in what way those um, animals in the film perhaps represented in a personified fashion. The actual characteristics of the animal life. So there becomes a little bit more educational value where I can see you took an entertaining uh, a video, but you were using it to reinforce some concepts about science, and therefore maybe I have a little bit of a case for uh, for fair use. Neat. I think what's important to represent about this too is that there's a reasonableness factor oh. within the fair use reasoning too that says, look, if I've thought through it and I have some justification, um, and this will be in our situations as well um, in the activities we do within this unit, you you have a little bit uh, a little bit more play. So again, if we come back to my questions, did the unlicensed use transform the material or use it for the same intent and purpose? Or did it just simply repeat that work for the same intent and value as the original? And then was the material taken appropriate and kind in amount? So those are the two questions that you want to focus on. Uh, now we have some really great resources both within um, the Media Education Lab as well as a user community um, that's called Copyright Confusion and we're going to show you where those resources are located. But let's do this case study that's coming up here, right? So this is another case study that we want to analyze. Uh, students make a DVD of the class yearbook, uh, right? This is, this is a very new trend and we see it all the time. They're, they use 18 AP photos and copyrighted pop music to create a montage that captures the spirit and climate of the times. So now, Kristen, when you hear about this context and situation, 
what questions do you have, and how do you approach a fair use, making a fair fair use determination with the two well, big questions? Well, the first thing I have to think of is that this was the first image, and we were using Pharrell Williams' song, Happy. Um, that's something that's very popular in the year 2014, so thinking 2014, 2015, this might be a trend for those students. The fact that Pharrell is in a schoolyard, um, I'm thinking if perhaps we played a piece of that song, a uh, representative of the... Uh, way that a high school student might feel upon graduation um, and followed this particular screenshot with a piece of the happy song and some images from their senior year. Um, that might be a good argument in terms of it being transformative. Uh, we're not using the whole song, so we're using appropriate and kind an amount. Um, and when I think back to my high school years, long, long ago, um, it's the music of my times and the, that making the connection with the imagery that really kind of brings me back to the spirit. That's a pretty good fair use analysis. I'm really struck by that word montage because I, when I make a fair use determination, I always ask myself, could, could this new, could this unlicensed use, this unauthorized use, could it substitute or replace the original? And a montage that includes a little bit of the happy song is never going to replace the ha watching the whole happy song or using the whole happy song. So the montage element to me seems really important there. Mm -hmm. It would be more complicated if the whole song were used because it's possible that such a reconfiguration of the song could serve as a substitute for the original. Absolutely. And then it might not be fair use. Yeah, and so we're going to point you out to a few uh, resources. Um, first, um, this link and the activities enclosed uh, will be a piece of your projects that you'll need to complete this activity. Mm -hmm. This is a wiki space called copyrightconfusion.wikispaces.com. And if I scroll down here, oh my goodness, um, I'm going to take a look on the left hand side. There is an area that says uh, reasoning fair use, and there are some scenarios that you can that you can practice. And it it's actually going to bring you to a tool um, that. Uh, reviews the code of reasoning, uh, code of best practices for reasoning fair use, which we're going to talk about in the next unit. And it gives you some rationale and a purpose, and um, gives you an idea of how you might justify um, a use of as being fair. When I'm teaching my students how to make a fair use determination, I ask them to complete the fair use reasoning tool because it invites them to be metacognitive. Mm -hmm. What's your purpose? What was the purpose of the original copyrighted work? Right? And what and and how does your purpose relate to the original, the author's original purpose? Did you use just how much you needed? And is it transformative? And then think about think about the rights of the owner in, in, in relation to your own needs. So then you can decide, do you want to ask for permission, pay a license fee, claim fair use, or use something else? This tool really helps learners be metacognitive about their choices, asking themselves, why am I using copyrighted uh, material for my own creative work, and am I being transformative? The other thing I want to point out on the Media Education Lab, and again, we're going to the copyright page, so www.mediaeducationlab.com slash copyright. Um, on this page, you'll see all kinds of additional resources, some PowerPoints and lesson plans. We're going to use one of these uh, case studies, the elementary case study, mm -hmm. within the scope of our lessons, but there are some additional resources here that you can use in terms of really spending some time thinking through the process and understanding how other teachers. Kristen's featured in the one under high school, but for this lesson, we invite you to look at the one about elementary school. Click on that one about elementary school. This is a very short uh, five-minute video. This is a very short five-minute video that we think is pretty helpful for understanding how teachers might involve uh, students using images from Google in a a creative production project and we'll invite you to look at that video offline but we think it can be really helpful in strengthening your understanding of how to make a fair use determination. Terrific. So we talked and we shared a little bit about our wiki space. Um, we've taken a look at some of the questions that you need to ask yourself and I really want to spend some time kind of reviewing our goals. Right. We, we think that in this little session we've introduced the idea that the doctrine of fair use supports the First Amendment and ensures that copyright law does not become an instrument of censorship. We hope that you've gained an appreciation of the con uh, concept of transformativeness. And, and we'll give you some more feedback on yeah, that as we go and we've, along. And we've modeled how to make a fair use determination so you see that 
making a fair use determination involves critical reasoning. There's no right or wrong answer until a case goes before a judge. So really being able to think through the dimensions of a fair use uh, analysis are something that we do as a matter of integrity and practice strengthens our fair use muscles. And so you're going to get an opportunity to do some practice throughout this next module. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Bye.